In the Gospels, there are two conversations that take place at different times that have a very similar problem or a similar tone to them. Uh, and both of them involve the disciples falling out with each other over something. And both are something that even today we continue as Christians to fall out over. And they involve something that for some people can be a real stumbling block. Prominence. Position. Being seen. There was a thing that was very common in the late 90s, early noughties, especially in big churches, where this idea was, was circulating, everyone is a leader. I remember one church in particular that uh, came to present something to us and they, were, they had moved into the cell structure and they were actually saying everyone in church should be a leader. And they were saying to the people that if you have enough people in the cell groups beneath your cell group, you'll be on staff. Now, I'm not sharing that to have a go at that church, but to point out what this idea does to us. Because then your outreach becomes about Prominence, it becomes about position. And when prominence and position become too important, it shifts to these mindsets where, you know, well, if the church wants me to do that, they can pay me. Or even, well, the paid people should be doing that. And I understand why the everyone is a leader approach appeals because everybody wants to be seen. We have in us this built-in desire for prominence. And the disciples did too. The problem is, not everyone is a leader. And as a result, over years, people were put in positions in church where they lauded it over other people. And actually, there was a lot of damage done. The desire to be on top is actually contrary to the teaching of Jesus. And over the next two weeks, we're going to suggest something. Not that everyone is a leader, but in fact, everyone is a servant. You see, the servant heart should be the position of everyone in church life, no matter the position they are in, including those, in fact, I'd say especially those who lead. That'll be the uh, seagull. Let's ignore that. Let's treat it as a messenger of Satan. <laughs> and ignore it. <laughs> the servant heart should be the position of everyone in church. Not every servant is a leader, but I tell you, every leader must be a servant, through and through. And I want to look at these two conversations that took place in Scripture. And we'll start with the, we'll, we'll start with the disciple side of it first, and then we'll move on to what Jesus said back to them. I'm going to start with the one that happened last, because to me, it's the greatest tragedy of the two of them. Luke 22, 24. A dispute also arose among them as to which of them was to be regarded as the greatest. A dispute arises. Who is the greatest? Now, what do we mean by the greatest? Because that word means lots of different things. Just, uh, it, it can mean who is achieving the most, uh, who is growing most in their discipleship. But the context of this tells us the meaning of it. Um, first of all, we get that word regarded. Who is regarded as the greatest? See, regarded means it's about how people see you. About what they think of you. Who is thought of most highly? We're talking about position. We're talking about prominence. That's what they're arguing over. 
And who is it they want to be regarded by? Well, it's Jesus. And the context of the argument solidifies that. You see, I want us to take a moment just to picture the conversation and the argument taking place. It's not a random occasion. It's not around a campfire where they're, or where they're walking from place to place. It just hasn't cropped up in the middle of the day. What they're doing at this moment is preparing for Passover. They are preparing for the Last Supper. And what they're doing as they're preparing for the Last Supper is something you always do when you've got a lot of people coming for a meal. You sort out the seating arrangements. And in a Jewish feast, the seating arrangements were very definite and very important. You would have the host, the person throwing the meal, in the center. On his right would be the guest of first honor. On his left, the guest of second honor. Then the third honor was given to the person second on his right. Fourth honor, the second on his left. And so on and so on around the table. And it's this that leads to the argument. Who gets to sit here? Then who gets to sit here? Then here. Then here. I tell you, the worst thing you can do for a group of people is tell them to work out the order of their importance. Who gets the most prominent position? Who gets to sit closest to Jesus on this special occasion? Who does Jesus think should sit there? Who is the one worthy of the position of highest honor? What's the pecking order? <laughs> you, couldn't, you couldn't make it up. But does this sound like a familiar problem? How often do we get into these kinds of situations and conversations? See, they were defining themselves, not in relation to Jesus, because if you're going to define yourself into relation to Jesus, everybody's... <laughs> yeah? But they were defining themselves in relationship to each other. They were comparing themselves to each other. That never goes well, does it? But it gets worse. In verse 25, we read Jesus talks to them about it. He jumps in. In other words, they're having this argument, and Jesus is right there. They're having this argument in front of Jesus. I mean, come on, guys. <laughs> well, what makes this such a tragedy they're having this petty squabble in front of Jesus the day before he's going to give his life for us and them. At this Passover, where the, the Lord's Supper was began, this Passover Jesus long looked forward to, they're squabbling about position in front of him. You think, dear me, guys. And we'll come to Jesus' response in a moment, but let's first of all look at the other occasion. And the second one, I think, is a very curious one. Because on this occasion, it's not just the disciples who are coming to Jesus asking about position. But they also, some of them, bring their mums or their mum. Jesus has just taught that the laborers in the vineyard, about the laborers in the vineyard, and he's just said, he's just, he's just said this, the first will be last and the last will be first. Like that's just happened. He's then, he's then predicted for the third time he's going to die. So just to give you the context, that's the conversation that precedes this. And then the mother of the sons of Zebedee, the mother of James and John, Salome, who, as you may remember, was possibly Mary's sister and therefore Jesus' aunt. So just think of the context here. Jesus has just predicted his death again. He's just said the first will be last and the last will be first. 
you've got to wonder about a timing. It's not the best. And this is not the day before Jesus is going to give his life, but about a week before Jesus is going to give his life. Matthew 20, verses 20 to 21. Then the mother of the sons of Zebedee came up to him with her sons, and kneeling before him, she asked him for something. And he said to her, What do you want? She said to him, Say that these two sons of mine are to sit, one at your right hand and one at your left, in the kingdom. Again, listen to what she's asking for here. The same thing as the meal. The right hand and the left hand. The two positions of highest honor. Now, James and John don't get off lightly here. They are with her while she asks. In fact, it looks like she's asking on their behalf. It's, they've got their mum to do their dirty work. Like, okay, mum, you're Jesus' aunt. You've got a bit of authority here. If you ask him, maybe it has a bit more weight to it. Actually, in the book of Mark, it records James and John as the ones who asked. Almost like Matthew puts the focus on the mother, but Mark out and out says, look, this was their idea. Don't, don't think this wasn't them. And when the other ten hear this, they are absolutely annoyed. It's at Matthew 20, verse 24. And the ten heard it. They were indignant at the two brothers, it says. They were indignant. Why? Well, indignant's a good word. See, the context shows how Jesus speaks to all of them in a moment. Shows they are, This is not righteous indignation. They're not thinking, oh, how appalling their behavior is. They're thinking... I'm really annoyed they thought of it first. We also know that by the time we get to the Last Supper, like less than a week's time, they'll still be arguing about this. Both of these occasions show how the disciples missed so much of the point of the kingdom of God. I mean, Jesus just said the first shall be last. And the last shall be first. But let's be honest, guys. Doesn't this look a bit like us sometimes? What's my position? Where's my place? Where's my recognition? Who amongst us is the greatest? Who hears from God best? Who's the best witness? Who's the one who goes out of their way their most? Who prays longest? I don't understand how these guys could be jostling for personal reward in front of Jesus. And then I think about how often, actually, we kind of do the same. And when you think about it, when you think about the goodness and the greatness of God, I tell you, it really puts into perspective how ludicrous the whole thing is. We are like ants standing in front of a man, arguing about which ant is the tallest. I mean, it doesn't matter. <laughs> to the man, they're all ants. They're all tiny. Any difference is minuscule. Matthew Henry puts it like this. He says, Those are commonly most confident who are least acquainted with the cross. Nothing makes mis more mischief among brethren than the desire for greatness. It's wise words. Wise words. And Jesus takes the disciples to task on both of these occasions. And I just want to look at them both. First of all, the Passover. Luke 22, verses 25 to 30. And he said to them, The kings of the Gentiles exercise lordship over them, 
and those in authority over them are called benefactors. But not so with you. Rather, let the greatest among you become as the youngest, and the leader as one who serves. For who is the greater, the one who reclines at the table or the one who serves? Is it not the one who reclines at the table? But I am among you as one who serves. Those of you who have stayed with me in my trials, and I assign to you, as my Father assigned to me a kingdom, that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and sit on thrones judging the twelve tribes of Israel. See, Jesus points out, he says, look, it is the way of the world, not the way of the kingdom, when we look to exercise lordship or control over others. And Jesus is saying kingdom leadership, kingdom values do not work like that at all. Every leader should be one who serves. He then brings that back to himself. He says, that very night, he served them. That very night, before they had this argument, he washed their feet. The king of the universe washed their dirty feet. He did it as an example of the servant nature of a leader. And already the same night, they've forgotten the point. It's also pointing towards what would happen that night. He was about to be arrested and give his life in the greatest act of service. I tell you, worldly ambition and the seeking of prominence has never looked more ugly than it did that night. And Jesus responds to it by saying, if you have position, your primary duty is to serve. This is something society needs to learn. From governments that play by their own rules rather than the rules they hold others to, to those who lord it over their family, those who lord it over their friends, and in church we've got to get this. We've got to get this. No pastor should ever use position to take advantage of those in their church. No leader should ever think of themselves as greater than those they serve. Listen, if a pastor tries to convince you, you should be cleaning his calf room. He is not a servant leader. And equally, it is good to desire responsibility and ways to serve. 1 Timothy 3.1 says, The saying is trustworthy. If anyone aspires to the office of overseer, he desires a noble task. After all, he who desires the role of an overseer desires something that's good. But it's desiring the job, the ability to serve, the ability to make a difference that's good. The desiring of the title is not a good thing. It says aspires to the office, not aspires to the position or the title. And it's sad to say in life, those who aspire most for power are those who are often very worst, very least worthy of it. Here's the response Jesus gives to James and John and their mum. Matthew 20, verses 22 to 23. Jesus answered, you do not know what you're asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I am to drink? They said to him, we are able. He said to them, you will drink my cup, but to sit at my right hand and my left hand, it's not mine to grant. But it's for those who have been prepared by my father. He says, you don't know what you're asking, guys. You don't know what I'm about to face. I wonder if they knew what Jesus meant by, are you able to drink from the cup I drink from? Whether they would have given the same answer. <laughs> because they answer that question very quickly. They say, 
they will drink from the cup. Of course we will. Yet that following week, both of them slept in Gethsemane. Both of them ran away when Jesus was arrested. And only one of them was there at the cross. We need to be very careful how quick we are to answer God. Sometimes we don't know what we're saying. And then Jesus shows another remarkable act of servanthood and submission to the Father, saying, that position's not mine to grant. It's the Father's. I was trying to find an eloquent way to put this, but uh, Charles Spurgeon says it better. Charles Spurgeon says, He comes to do not his own will, but the will of him that sent him. So he correctly says of rank in his kingdom, it is not mine to give. How thoroughly did our Lord take a lowly place for our sake. In this laying aside of authority, he gives a silent rebuke to our self-seeking. He puts that so well. But the other disciples have all had their noses put out. So then Jesus turns to them all and he says, Matthew 20, 25 to 28. But Jesus called them and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lorded over them. He's going over this again later. But, and their great ones exercise authority over them. It shall not be so among you. He tells them this twice on two separate occasions and they still don't get it. But whoever among you, sorry, but whoever would be great among you must be your servant. And whoever will be first among you must be your slave, even as the Son of Man came, not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. So again, he comes to how the Gentiles and people in authority lord it over others. Once again, he's saying, that is not the way the kingdom of God works. It shall not be like that for you. The kingdom does not work that way. Greatness does not consist of commanding others to do things for you. It consists of doing things for others. And the greater the service, the greater the honor. He says, if you want to be great, serve. Stop trying to be first. Stop trying to be on top. Try putting yourself last. You know, the path to becoming selfless is to consider yourself less. He then once again turns it to an example of himself. He says, he did not come to be served. He came to serve by giving his life as a ransom for many. Jesus came not to occupy a throne but to occupy a cross. He came for a crown not of gold, but of thorns. Jesus came to give his life as a ransom for many. What does that mean? It means men are in the grip of a power of evil that they cannot break themselves. That was true then, that's true today. Sin drags us down. Sin separates us from God. Sin wrecks lives. And wrecks the world. A ransom is paid for something to, given to liberate someone from a situation they can't get free from. It's impossible for someone to free themselves unless they're ransomed. So Jesus is saying quite simply, it costs the life and death of Jesus to bring mankind back to God. That's the only difference between us and our former selves, isn't it? It's the cross of Jesus. We could never free ourselves from sin, but Jesus did that work completely. Can I say, if anyone's watching, and you find yourself lost and trapped and unable to break free, you can't do it yourself. You can't. 
Only Jesus can break those chains because only Jesus, who is God himself, came and gave his life as a ransom for you. He is the only answer to the problem you have. You know, Jesus is the greatest example to all of us. King of the universe, creator of heaven and earth. I tell you what, if anyone deserves position and acclaim, it's him. But he came humbly. He was born in a manger. He lived a life with no place to lay his head. And he served. The king of the universe came as a servant. Those in office in government, those in office in church, those in positions of power across the world must never forget their call is to be a servant, not to be served. Our race is not a race to see who's on top. It's a race to the bottom. We are not here to outdo each other in any way, shape, or form apart from one. Romans 12.10 Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. That's the only competition we have. That's the only way we're trying to outdo each other is by honoring each other more. And that's the kind of competition nobody loses. That's what Jesus did. The same night they were arguing about who's the greatest, he's washing their feet. And the next day, he's given his life. How foolish that argument must have felt the following day. Can you imagine? Looking back at that night, thinking, what, what on earth were we doing? How pointless. We must not seek to exalt ourselves above others. You know, Matthew 23, verses 9 to 12 says this, And call no man your father on earth. Just a little one for the Catholics there. For you have one father who is in heaven. Neither be called instructors, for you have one instructor, the Christ. The greatest among you shall be your servant. Whoever exalts himself will be humbled. And whoever humbles himself will be exalted. Jesus is our example. <laughs> he didn't just say it. He lived it. He is the king who came as a servant. Paul picks up on this in the book of Philippians. Philippians 1, verses 3 to 8. He says, Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you not look to his own interests, but the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death. Even death on a cross. What an example our Jesus is. He emptied everything he had for others. He took the form of servant. He didn't seek his own agenda or his own position. Rather, he did what the Father told him to do. A true leader does not seek people to serve them for their own benefit. A true leader seeks to serve others. A true leader does not have a party while telling other people they can't. A true leader doesn't say, clean the toilets, but have no intention of ever doing so themselves. A true leader does not propose to do his own will, but instead says, God, what is your will? 
A true leader does not promote themselves, but instead looks to God and makes sure everybody who's looking at them isn't looking at them, but it's looking at God. I'd say, sadly, in this world, we're missing true leaders way too often. We've got leadership completely upside down. Every leader should first and foremost be a servant, and anyone who seeks to lead should really be seeking to serve. And those who are given leadership should be people who are already serving anyway. I know if we've been looking through, you know, uh, this week, uh, looking at appoint deacons, one of the first questions you're asking any role is, are they already serving? <laughs> In our world today, a leader will ask you to lay down your life for them. Would Jesus lay down his for you? So what about us? Do we look for position? Or instead, do we look for opportunities to serve? Do we, why would we seek a claim when Jesus didn't? The greatest leader in the church, Paul, he knew he was nothing more than a servant. Romans 1, 1, Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle and set apart for the gospel of God. He knew exactly what he was, a servant of Christ. Everyone who leads in any position, especially in church, must serve. Not every servant is a leader. Leadership's a calling and a responsibility. That does not come to everyone. But every leader must be a servant. Everyone is a servant. And my challenge to you this morning is, as we go about this week, to ask that question. What motivates you? What motivates you to get involved in things? Is it the acclaim? Is it the thanks? Is it the hope it might lead to position? Or is it seeking to do the will of God? Is it looking for more ways to show God's love to people? Is it looking for ways to prefer others to yourself? Because it's not an easy question. But I don't want you to limit this to just what you do in church. Jesus didn't limit this to just church. For Jesus, this is about every way of life. How we should be in every area in our lives. Are you a servant when it comes to your career or are you looking to get promotion? Are you a servant with your family or does your family exist to serve you? Your friends and your church. We find a wonderful example in our servant king. But sadly, many who follow the servant king don't follow his example. Church, let's make sure we do. Father, thank you for sending your one and only son. I thank you for the death he died, that he came to serve. And we thank you for the cross. When I look, Lord, at the disciples and how they could argue in front of you, I wonder how they could do it. And then I look at my life, I look at my heart, and I get it. Lord, I pray, Lord, for humility for all of us, for that servant heart for all of us, that, Lord, as we, as a body, Seek to move forward in you, Lord. That, Lord, for all of us, we will all go forward 
with a servant's heart. You are our example, the King of Kings, yet you came to serve. Lord, I pray that's true for all of us. Lord, I pray that's true for me. And Lord, I pray you rebuke me when I ever dare forget that. And I pray that for all of us too. Amen. Amen.